Scientists have been trying to figure out how human language developed over time. One idea, called the mirror system model, suggests that language started from our ancestors being able to copy complex actions with their hands. This ability to learn and perform complicated and organized actions was important for working together and teaching each other. At first they used hand gestures like mime to communicate. These gestures became more standardized over time so everyone could understand them better. Then people started using sounds along with hand gestures to talk to each other. This early form of talking, before full-blown languages with grammar, changed over time through learning and sharing within communities, rather than changes in human genes. Some scientists believe that when we started using sounds more for communication, this change was linked to how our brains process language. Mostly, we use the left side of our brains for language, and this might also be related to why most people are right-handed. According to this view, our ability to communicate moved from using our hands to using our mouths and sounds. As this happened, the way our brains are set up for talking and understanding also shifted. When we see more right-handed tools and objects from ancient times, it might mean that people were starting to use sounds and spoken words more than hand gestures to communicate. Scientists explore the evidence and possibilities regarding language development and tool usage among ancient humans, particularly focusing on Homo heidelbergensis, Neanderthals, and anatomically modern Homo sapiens. There is compelling evidence showing population-level right-handedness in tool usage among Homo heidelbergensis, Neanderthals, and modern humans. These groups all had relatively large brains. Additionally, there are indicators of speech-relevant physical adaptations in these species, such as the morphology of the hyoid bone, the structure of the thoracic spinal canal, and genetic markers, like the FOXP2 gene found in Neanderthals, associated with speech capabilities in humans. It is widely accepted that Neanderthals might have developed a basic form of language known as vocal proto-language, thanks to these physical and genetic traits. However, the presence of a grammatical structure within Neanderthal language remains speculative. The emergence of language involves both biological evolution and cultural shifts, and it is uncertain if Neanderthals had the necessary conditions for such evolution. The sophistication observed in Neanderthal toolmaking, particularly the creation of composite tools around 300,000 years ago, hints at cognitive abilities that could parallel the basics of linguistic grammar. These tools, which required assembling multiple components, suggest an understanding of complex, organized processes akin to the rules of grammar. Some researchers propose that the ability to tie knots evidenced through tool-making could closely align with the cognitive requirements for understanding and applying grammatical rules. Despite suggestive evidence, there is still a gap in fully understanding Neanderthal cognitive capabilities and their use of language. More in-depth experimental analysis of Neanderthal stone tool technology is needed to explore this further. Research emphasizes assessing fossil evidence related to the evolution of the Neanderthal vocal tract as a means to understand their potential for articulate speech better. By examining both the physical adaptations and the technological innovations of Neanderthals, researchers aim to piece together the puzzle of whether Neanderthals could communicate using a form of language that included structured grammatical speech. Philip Lieberman's influential work on language evolution focuses on the unique aspects of human vocal tract anatomy and its role in speech production. His research comes at a time when the field was deeply influenced by Komsky's theories and the rise of cognitive science. Lieberman argued for a comprehensive approach to understanding language evolution, emphasizing not just syntax and semantics, 
but also the physical mechanisms of sound production and perception. Lieberman proposed that the ability to perceive and decode a rapid sequence of sounds from the speaker's vocal tract is crucial for speech. This process involves understanding a swift flow of complex sounds, which allows a speaker to compress a significant amount of information into a short utterance. This utterance is then processed by the listener's working memory, helping to understand its syllabic structure and meaning. This theory explains how sounds in speech are produced through the interaction between a sound source, like vocal cord vibrations, and the vocal tract, which acts as an acoustic filter. The vocal tract's shape can be changed by movements of the articulators, tongue, teeth, lips, and volume, altering its acoustic properties. This is particularly relevant for vowels, where different shapes of the vocal tract result in different resonances or formants, which are essential for vowel identification. Lieberman pointed out that certain vowels, a, I, U, have stable acoustic patterns across different articulation points, making them common in human languages. He argued that producing these quantal vowels requires a vocal tract anatomy capable of independent constriction of two cavities, front and back, with the ability to produce abrupt transitions between these sections. This capability is unique to humans, facilitated by anatomical features such as a lowered larynx and hyoid bone, which allow for greater control and variation in sound production. According to Leiberman, the human vocal tract is uniquely adapted for speech, with specific anatomical features that enable a wide range of sound production not possible in non-human primates. These adaptations allow for the independent control of different parts of the vocal tract, critical for the complex articulations required for speech. Non-human primates lack the vocal tract anatomy that would allow for the production of the wide range of vowel sounds found in human speech. Their vocal tract configuration, primarily oriented horizontally within the mouth, restricts them to simpler sounds and precludes the complex articulatory gestures characteristic of human speech. Lieberman's work underscores the evolutionary adaptations of the human vocal tract that underpin our unique capacity for speech, bridging biological evolution with the development of linguistics. His theories highlight how natural selection has shaped our ability to communicate complex ideas and emotions through spoken language, distinguishing humans from other primates. This adaptation, despite its associated risk of increasing choking hazards due to the separation of the epiglottis from the velium, is deemed essential for the development of spoken language. The relevance of this research was highlighted against the backdrop of discussions on the Heimlich maneuver, emphasizing the trade-offs involved in this anatomical change. Lieberman and Creelin's work involved analyzing the reconstructed vocal tract anatomy of Neanderthals. They observed that the Neanderthal larynx was placed higher in the neck, akin to what is seen in non-human primates and human newborns. This placement was inferred from the similarities between the Neanderthal cranial base and mandible with those of human newborns, suggesting a developmental stage less conducive to speech than that of adult modern humans. The research team delved into the acoustic potential of Neanderthals by modeling based on the three-dimensional reconstruction of the La chapelle au saint fossil. This involved creating silicon rubber casts of the vocal tracts from an adult modern human, a newborn modern human, a chimpanzee, and a reconstructed Neanderthal specimen. Their findings indicated that the Neanderthal vocal tract, due to its larynx's higher positioning, resembled that of newborn modern humans and chimpanzees more closely than that of adult modern humans. The study focused on predicting the formants of quantal vowels, A, I, and U, 
which are crucial for distinguishing vowel sounds in speech. The analyses showed that the vowel space predicted for Neanderthals was substantially more limited than that documented for modern humans, pointing to Neanderthals' restricted ability to produce the diverse sounds essential for complex speech. This limitation was attributed to the Neanderthals' lack of independent variability in their pharyngeal cavity, which in modern humans is achieved through anteroposterior movements of the dorsal tongue. Lieberman further supported his findings by examining other fossil skulls, which suggested that the vocal tract's capacity for speech production varied significantly between Neanderthals and modern humans. He noted anatomical features such as the alignment of the styloid process and the orientation of muscle attachment points in Neanderthals that indicated a vocal tract configuration not well suited for producing the nuanced sounds necessary for articulated speech. Finally, Lieberman argued that the anatomical adaptations facilitating a wide range of speech sounds in the modern human vocal tract did not occur in Neanderthals. This distinction suggests a selective evolutionary pressure on the vocal tract anatomy of modern humans for the development of stable and complex speech capabilities, a progression not evidenced in the Neanderthal lineage. The debate over Neanderthal speech capabilities offers a fascinating glimpse into the intersection of anatomy, acoustics, and evolutionary biology. Initially, the difference in basocranial flexion, greater in modern humans than in Neanderthals, was thought to indicate a distinction in laryngeal descent and, by extension, speech capabilities. However, this idea has been challenged by subsequent anatomical studies, leading researchers to explore other methods of reconstructing Neanderthal vocal tracts and their implications for speech. Louis-Jean Beau proposed a different approach, suggesting that the Neanderthal larynx and hyoid bone were positioned lower in the vocal tract than Lieberman's earlier reconstructions indicated. He based their model on correlations between larynx height and various skull and mandible dimensions from a modern human reference sample. This model was used to generate the maximal Neanderthal vowel space, employing a statistical method that considers the full range of possible articulatory gestures. Their findings suggested that Neanderthals could have produced a vowel space not significantly different from that of modern humans, challenging the notion that Neanderthals lacked modern human-like speech capabilities. Critiques of louis jean Beau methodology argue that it does not conclusively validate the inferred position of the Neanderthal hyoid and tongue root, potentially biasing the reconstructed Neanderthal vowel space towards modern human-like configurations. De Boer and Fitch specifically pointed out the risk of applying a model that encompasses all possible modern human vocal tract shapes to Neanderthals without direct evidence for such anatomical similarities. Further research by De Boer utilized a direct motion model of the articulators to explore how larynx height affects vowel space potential. This approach allowed for precise control over the vocal tract's anatomy in simulations, revealing that the optimal vocal tract for a broad articulatory range does not necessarily require a larynx positioned as low as in post-pubertal modern males. This finding suggests that speech enhancement may not have been the sole or even primary evolutionary pressure for the descent of the larynx in modern humans. Scientists introduce a new study focusing on the speech potential of Neanderthals, aiming to refine our understanding of their vocal communication capabilities. By reconstructing the positions of the hyoid and tongue root and employing software models to examine the effects of various articulator positions on vowel space, this research seeks to provide clearer insights into Neanderthal speech. Additional evidence from tool use, skeletal analyses, and ancient DNA contributes to a growing body of indirect evidence supporting the complexity 
of Neanderthal vocal communication. The goal is to move beyond the polarized views that have historically dominated discussions about Neanderthal speech by methodically building on direct and indirect evidence. This nuanced approach aims to offer a more comprehensive understanding of Neanderthal linguistic capabilities, acknowledging the complexity of the factors that influence speech evolution.